Good morning, Deb. Good morning. Thank you for your willingness to be with us today for a very long, long 30-minute recording interview. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I have a series of questions that I'd like to ask of you. Are you ready to begin? Yes. Let's do it. Okay. When did you arrive in Plymouth? I came to Plymouth in August of 1988. 88. And at that time, was it Plymouth Teachers College, Plymouth State College, Plymouth University? Plymouth it was, State. yep, Plymouth State College. Okay. And you don't have to answer this question, but I always ask you, yeah. do you recall your first year's salary? Actually, I do. It was $11,813. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And I'm beaming yeah. over here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, can you recall the po uh, population of the students around? I think it was about 3,000 at that time. Would that be graduates and e undergraduates? Yes. Wow. And how many employees might we have had at that time? Probably between 100 and 200, including everybody. Times have changed. Yes, they have. They certainly have. Yes. How many years were you employed at Plymouth State? I was here for 32 years and four months. And that is a, is it a year-long position? E yes. Okay. Yep, it is, yes. And in what capacity were you hired? I was hired as a clerk typist in the residential life department. And over years, that evolved into an administrative assistant at different levels, one, two, and three. So when I left, I was a, an, an admin level three. And what responsibilities were you required to pursue? Yeah, um, I actually was the, the first frontline office contact. So um, I greeted everyone that came in the office. I answered the telephone, and um, I did a lot of administrative things like uh, meal plan changes and collecting keys. Um, I ordered office supplies. But basically, my job was to greet people. I and was just going to say, that sounds the most fun. Yeah. <laughs> that you gave me. Yeah. So you were in contact with students? Yep, yeah, every day. Every day. Yeah, we had student workers. <clears throat> we had students that would come into the office all the time. For, you know, they might have a roommate conflict, they might want to change their meal plan, they want, might want to complain because the, they didn't want to eat in the dining hall because of the food, it wasn't home cooked. Um, we had kids that uh, tried to get out of their contracts because they wanted to live with friends off campus. So we dealt with a lot of our off campus landlords at the time too. Um, and, you know, it was lots of different issues. Is there a policy, maybe you're not aware of this, but what's the current policy? If I enter Plymouth State as a first year student, am I required to live on campus now? Yes. Yep, you have to live on campus until you have uh, attained so many credits or if you uh, are a certain age by the beginning of the school year. Hmm. If you have served two years in the military service, then you can opt out of that contract. Or if you um, request to live from home to be a commuter, uh, there is a process that you uh, and your parents would have to go through in order for that to happen. And I believe it's a 50 mile radius from campus. Other than that, you're required to live on campus. What were your first few years at Plymouth State like? Oh, it was really very special back then. Um, we were a very close-knit community here, and we all worked together as a family. And if somebody needed help, residential life was always the department that people looked at to try and um, make things right. And it was just fun to come to work every day. Um, I worked with a great a group of people in Res Life, Frank Cucciarella, Deb LeBlanc, Gail Stone, Carbonell, Dave Carpentier, Tom Weeks, and we worked together for years um, and years, and we were very, um, just very, a very close-knit group. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's great to hear. It's yep. so important for us to enjoy the people that we work with. Right, then exactly. It then it's not work. Right, right. <laughs> it's like going from home to come to home. I, that's
the next question, how does the student population change over your years? And I think what you're going to say is. Yeah, it's grown tremendously. I did look yesterday and I think we have 4,400 something um, students enrolled here now. So it's, it has grown a lot and a lot of those students now live off campus. So I know when I left in 2020, we had about 50% that lived on and 50% that lived off. Um, a lot of students wanted single rooms, which we had limited amount of here. And over time, uh, there were more and more students that requested to live off campus because of um, anxiety or some type of disability or you know they had some type of a diet that the dining hall couldn't offer them. So there were different reasons that, you know, they were able to go off campus after they did, went through a certain process. So you're saying over the years we're receiving more and more requests yes. from the students? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and we had to accommodate them. If we couldn't give them what they needed on campus, then obviously we had to let them go off campus. Yeah. Many of the folks that I've spoken to they have a main job, yours, mm -hmm. but they also had other opportunities. They were on other committees, perhaps. Did yeah. you work in any other capacity? Yep, um, I was on several different committees. Um, the main one I was on was fundraising and scholarship. That actually started out as the Marie Connolly Education Scholarship. She was the secretary in the education department for years and passed away and a scholarship was set up in her honor. Over the years it evolved into the operating staff um, scholarship and I was part of the initial committee that worked on that. We had to raise $5,000 in order to start that scholarship and we did that through bake sales, car washes, 50-50 raffles. We raffled off a trip to Bermuda one year. We had a big Thanksgiving turkey raffle every year. And um, we were able in 2006 to set that up. And then actually when I retired um, in 2020, they renamed it to the Deborah A. Underwood Staff Scholarship, which was quite an honor. Congratulations, <laughs> deserving. Thank you. That's exciting. That's yes. Exciting. And then I was on nominating committee. Um, I also was on professional development committee for several years, um, which I do not believe that um, committee is in function right now, we gave money to operating staff and to PAT members to attend workshops, take classes, go to conferences, and I really enjoyed that because as a member of the operating staff, I met a lot of people like the PATs that I didn't work with, and I just, I really enjoyed that, yeah. I would agree with you. I think that's the best part of Plymouth State is, of course, the students, but the people that we work with, even outside of our departments. Oh, yes, definitely, yes. I'm going to ask a private question. Where were you born? I was born in Duxbury, Massachusetts. Okay, okay. How did you come here? Well, um, I went to the University of Southern Maine in Gorham, Maine, which at the time was called Gorham State college and uh, I met my husband there and he was two years ahead of me in school and he got a teaching job here in Plymouth which he stayed at for 43 years. We got married in 1974 and we moved here. Um, I couldn't get a job when I first came here because I was a certified teacher and there was an SAU policy that a husband and wife couldn't teach in the same school system so that cut out a lot of our local area schools. So I was aide at Holden Central School for two years. Then I went to Burnley Corporation in Lincoln and I was the plant manager secretary there for five years. Then I went to the high school guidance office and was a secretary. It was a very stressful job there because everybody in town knew me and parents would call and say, hey, can you check on Susie's grades but don't let her know I'm calling. And I just, I needed a a job that was less stressful. I had a, one child at the time and he was seven and um, this opportunity came up for me. I was asked on a Friday if I might be interested in the job. I said, okay, I'll check it out. And they said, okay, can you be in our office Monday for an interview? And then they hired me before I even left. So it, things were totally different back then. 
I never even went to human resources or anything, and then I started the next week. Maybe we'll have to blank that out. Things have changed a little bit. Yeah, yeah, they have. <laughs> so when I asked you the question, why did you choose Plymouth? Yeah. You had tried many other positions, but this one fit for your needs. Right, right. Um, it, you know, it was a very flexible job for my to raise my family. My husband was very busy because he coached all year and he did sports and so I needed a job that really I could just come to and go home to at night and I didn't have to worry about anything and it just seemed to be a good fit. Um, I knew the people that I was going to be working with. I didn't really know a lot about the college at the time, just uh, you know from friends that would complain about the students being noisy in the neighborhoods. <laughs> but I just, you know, I knew this was the right fit for me. Oh, that's great. And yeah. you can say that in retirement. Yes. It was the right fit. Oh, yes, definitely. That's yes. Right. That's right. Yeah. Uh, and this goes along with it. When you arrived in Plymouth and you looked around, what were your first thoughts? What did you think about the town? Well, uh, there wasn't much here actually except Main Street. Uh, Tenney Mountain wasn't even developed out there. There weren't any traffic lights in town. We had three grocery stores uh, downtown. Um, we had Adams Supermarket and the First National and what was the other one? There was one other one. We can call Volpe's a supermarket. Yeah, Volpe's, right, Volpe's, yep, yep. Um, you know, lots of pizza places. And uh, unfortunately, over time, a lot of our mom and pop stores have gone out of business, like Saliba's and Richelson's and Farley's Drug Store, Little Anthony's Pizza Restaurant. Um, the P Plymouth Inn is gone. So much is gone. And a lot of businesses have come in and gone, but there aren't a lot of ones that are still here from back when I came in 74. 74. Yep, 74. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's when I first came to Plymouth, yes. When you came to Plymouth, was there anyone, Plymouth State now, was there anyone that um, had an influence on you that you could chat with? Yeah. Um, I had two supervisors that I considered to be great role models, um, Tim Keefe and Frank Cucciarella. They really helped me try to balance my work life with my home life. And I had, you know, eventually I had three kids, I was working full time, and like I said, my husband was a teacher and a coach, so we were a very busy family. And I had a, a hard time trying to adjust to that, but they were really great. Um, and Dick Hage, who was the director of student affairs, he was absolutely awesome. And he was so concerned about the students. And because he, you know, overlooked our department, we all looked up to him a lot as well. That's good. That's good. What influence do you think you might have had over your decades here at Plymouth on students, maybe on your colleagues? Yep. I am a very uh, caring person and a very good listener. And I think that anybody that came into the office would feel better when they left because I always try to help solve their problems even with colleagues if they were having a bad day I would say okay what can I help you know we work together really as a team um, when parents called on the phone um, you know there were many frantic phone calls from parents over one issue or another I would try to talk them through things and many times they would thank me afterwards um, and I felt like I really helped a lot of people while I was here. Thank you for doing that. Yep. I mean that's the best part of what we do. Oh yes, definitely, yes. As we think back in the decades that you were here, what changes have taken place? One, at Plymouth State, yep. and two, maybe we can talk about, well, you've talked a little bit about the town already, but right. Plymouth State, what changes have you seen? Well, I think um, I'm going to talk about res life a little bit, because when I first came here, we had seven residence halls. We had Belknap, Blair, Mary Lyon, Samuel Reed Hall, and Grafton and Smith. Mary Lyon was all female. Samuel Reed Hall was all male. 
and the other halls were either co-ed by floor or co-ed by wing. And after several years, they became co-ed by door. And like now, a male and a female can live together, which was like n totally no-no back in, in the 80s and 90s. I mean, it took a long time for that to happen. We did have one set of apartments. Um, in 1989, I believe the second set of apartments was built. And you know, then Langdon Woods was added and um, Merrill Place was added. Um, the the non-traditional apartments were married family apartments. And those were here for years until they decided not to let families here. And I think that was an issue with t because the college would have to pay tuition to the schools if they had young children. And so we eventually stopped doing that. Um, yeah, but there's been a lot of changes. So, you know, Belknap Hall, um, Mary Lyon Hall, Geneva Smith Hall, and Samuel Reed Hall were all closed for a year for renovations. And then, I, I can't remember exactly what year, but then Samuel Hall Reed was changed from a residential hall to an academic building. And now I believe it is mostly physical therapy and maybe nursing in there. So, you know, a lot, a lot did change. Our office actually physically moved four different times. When I was hired in 1988, we were on the third floor in Spear. Then in 1989, the college purchased the Holmes House. And so the residential life office moved to the Holmes House. In 2007, after Mary Lyon Hall was renovated, our office moved to the basement of Mary Lyon. And then in 2017, we moved back to Spear onto the second floor. So we had several uh, office moves, and um, I loved every place we were. I think my favorite was the Holmes House, though, because we, we, we had that whole building and people would come if they needed something. And it was just like you were going from home to a home. And it was just so comfy, cozy, and just the, the aesthetics of the building. Oh, I love the history of the building. Yes, yes, yeah. exactly. I'm just thinking now, I'm taking, I, I want to take notes with everything you said, how Plymouth has changed. Yeah. That would be a neat little booklet. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The yeah, the dining service has also changed. At, at one point, Residential Life kind of took control of dining services, and our department turned to Residential Life and dining services. Um, and, you know, over my years here, we started out with DACA, and then from there, there was Morrison's. And then we had Sodexo, and then now we have Chartwells, Chartwells, which we call PSU Dining now to incorporate it into the college. But there's been a lot of changes with dining. You know, they cater um, to students who need restricted diets, and I mean, back then you probably had a couple of different choices in cereal, you know. Um, but I think they have, they're serve much healthier food and they really tried to cater to the students needs more and I think that's important to note also. And I'm assuming you're sharing this because students have shared that with you. Yes, that's yes. Great. I know when a parent would call and say my daughter can't find anything to eat over there and I would say okay I've eaten there several times there's plenty of food there they just need to look around you know and be creative. In your position, how involved were you, if at all, in campus government? My last two years here, the operating staff and the PAT group merged as one unit and we became the Senate. And I was one of the senators on that um, committee. Um, other than committee work, I really didn't do a lot with the government. But the committees were certainly part of the government. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Again, as we look back, what were your major contributions to the college, one, to the town, and maybe the state? Well, that's a good question. Uh, I would say, I think my main contribution was just, just being a friendly, caring person and trying to come to work every day with a positive attitude. 
Um, through my committee work, I think I did a lot of good for the college, especially establishing that scholarship with the members on the committee. And at the time, there was Fran Bean, Wendy Burnham, and there was one other, which I'll just quickly look up. Who's the fourth person? Uh, to our audience. Uh, Diane Tillotson it's was okay the. To take yeah, notes. It's okay <laughs> yeah to take I know. Notes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And our first recipient was a student from White Mountain um, who was a member of our wrestling team. His name was Matt Friend, and he received our first scholarship. Um, the scholarship was set up for upperclassmen because when we were getting ready to decide about the, um, you know, who was going to receive them. We decided that a lot of scholarships went to first year students and we needed to gear something to upper class students. So it had to be a New Hampshire student who was in need and was upper class student. So. And you can still remember the name. I can, yes. <laughs> yep. Uh huh. Uh, let's see. Uh, what, is there a story or two that you can remember, some, a memory, let's turn it into a memory, yeah. about Plymouth State that you are willing to share? I have a funny story. After our office moved to Mary Lane Hall, we were all settled, everything was brand new down there, and then one weekend the whole office flooded and had about six inches of standing water in it. Something to do with the perimeter drain around Mary Lane, it wasn't working or something. So physical plant came in and cleaned everything up and about, I don't know, maybe four or five weeks later, some people in our office were getting sick a lot, and so we discovered that there was mold infested in all the walls. So the whole office had to be redone, like, you know, halfway up with new sheetrock. So we all had to move out. So we ended up going down the hall into a big room where university studies used to be, but I don't think they're there now. Um, and we set up around a conference table. So there were six of us with telephones and little desks around this conference table. It looked like we were in a newsroom or we were working for someone running for our political office. But it was, it was really, we really bonded even more um, over those days because I think we were in there for about nine weeks. It was quite a long time. And it just proved to me that, you know, we were a very tight-knit group that could really get through most anything. Yeah. Being in Mary Lyon, may I ask if you ever went into the tunnels? I never did. I never did, but I know some people did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's yep. always a, it's not really a bone of contention. Yeah. Why was it designed? Was it to make sure the students didn't have to go outside and in the yep. weather? Yeah. I think it was part of the electrical system. Yeah. From what I understand. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, maybe yeah. you and I will take a trip sometime. Yeah, I know, that would be <laughs> nice. <laughs> and one other thing I just want to note, too, is um, the residence halls used to uh, do a big Halloween um, festival each year for the students, mm -hmm. and we would host, like, parties and games, and the residents that wanted to participate would be provided candy so the students could come and trick-or-treat. And then when all of the budget got really bad and whatnot, um, that program was cut out, and I, I was really sad about that because it was just one way to bring the students and the town people together, and I, th I think it, it was a big loss when that happened. Well, my hand's going up because yeah. I was one of those employees, and I brought my son, yeah. and he would have been this high, yeah. and it was safe. Right. We live in an area that there are not many neighbors. Yeah. And all of a sudden he got all of these treats and he saw all these lovely girls. So yeah, right. <laughs> He's like four years old. Right. Oh, I'm disappointed. So yeah. that, that's not a tradition anymore. No, it isn't. No, no. It, it was one of the things that was cut out of our department when the finances got bad. And hopefully at some point they'll reinstate it. But I, I was really sad to see that go. As you think back, what changes that have occurred over the past could we share with new people that we're going to hire from the state? We have a group, let's pretend we have a group right here, yeah. and you were asked to chat with them. A little about the university, its people. What might we share? 
Well, I, I think it's important to have change. But I don't think that we should change just to change. I think there should be a reason for all the changes that are made. And I also think that it's very important to have input from all parties. I think, it, especially with the staff people that work in, it, work every day with the students and with other staff members, if you, if you want to make a change, why not ask the people that are going to be affected what would happen if we make this change? And maybe the changes would still happen, but at least people would feel that they had a voice. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's very important to, for people to not be afraid to share their opinions or share their thoughts and ideas. Mm -hmm. I would agree. I yeah. would agree. Yeah. That's what helps us establish a community. Right. That's exactly. Mm -hmm. Yes. Is there anything else that we have um, not covered that you'd like to share with our audience? Well, I just want to say, uh, I hope I don't cry. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> I get a little emotional, but um, I worked here for 32 years, and I loved every day that I came to work. I took advantage of my earned time when my kids were sick and you know when I needed a day off, but I never took advantage of all the benefits that were here as far as um, I never took any classes, but everybody else in my family did. My son went to Keene, so I saved quite a bit of money for tuition. I mean, the college has a great benefit package, and I think people should be more appreciative of what they're given. Um, but I, uh, I just think it, it, was, it was a perfect job for me after, you know, after being hired. Mm -hmm. And um, I appreciate everything that I have, and I appreciate all the friendships that I made. I have a, a lot of um, student workers and resident assistants and community advisors, resident directors, co community directors, and even colleagues that I still keep in touch with. And, you know, they're a big part of my life and always will be. Thank you for sharing. It's a short interview, 30 minutes, but I think we pulled a lot into it. Yeah. And I think it's important for us to go back and the stories that we tell, hopefully they'll resonate with people. I agree.